Good afternoon. My name is Augusta Neka Nadi, and I'm the head of strategic communications for the Anambra State Investment Promotion and Protection Agency, ANSIPA. And I'll be your host for this session. Now, in today's webinar is dedicated to exploring the pivotal role of corporate governance in cultivating sustainable businesses, particularly in the face of the ever evolving global economic landscape. And we are honored to have industry leaders in our panel who would graciously share their professional and personal insight on this crucial topic. Our belief is that by unraveling these complexities of sustainable businesses, we can pave the way for cross-generational wealth transfer. Now, without further ado, I'm going to pass on the virtual button to Mr. Etike Osisioma, the Executive Director of ANSIPA, to deliver his welcome address and set the stage for this session. Um, Mr. Osisioma, are you there? Thank you so much, Augusta. And um, my name is Etike Osisioma, I'm the Executive Director of Anambra State Investment Promotion and Protection Agency. I would like to welcome everyone to this um, vital webinar that we're unable to take during the summit. And um, I just want to, on behalf of GMD management and the staff of ANSIPA, to appreciate everyone who has made out, especially the panelists, and most especially our daddy. I'm seeing you for the first time. You're welcome, sir. <laughs> You're welcome, sir. Yeah, Chief. Are you referring to Patrick? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> I'm so happy okay. to see you, sir. Okay. Uh, I'm so privileged. I've not had the opportunity. I saw your daughter, the chairman of the company, the other time, and I was just after you. You're welcome, and um, I just hope that we have a, a very useful session, and at the end of the day, we'll be happy, and uh, we pick one or two things that will help us in our corporate environment. So thank you so much for your time, and um, you're welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, E.D. And on behalf of the MD, he's at Cario. He's part of the governor's entourage. But he wanted to be here, but he asked the E.D. to represent him. I'm going to now pass over to the moderator, um, Mr. Patrick O. Okibo, the third. He's going to moderate this session, so I'll just call him up now on stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Augusta. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Patrick, Patrick Okibo. Um, here's the thing. Um, if aliens were to visit Nigeria today, you know, many may think that Nigerians did not have any businesses or corporations, you know, back in the 1960s. Most of today's successful companies commenced operations in the last three or four decades. Um, most pre-independence era, Nigerian-owned businesses are long dead. Only a handful of companies could weather the storm of the last six decades. Gone are the 1960s and 70s brands that dominated the various uh, economic sectors, transportation, construction, fast moving co consumer goods, uh, manufacturing, automotive industry, etc. Why were these businesses unable to transcend from their founders to the next generation? What are the challenges with corporate governance? wealth transfer and succession planning, investment mobilization, legal and regulatory challenges, et cetera. Ladies and gentlemen, um, as you can see, I have an all-star cast um, I, to help explain how corporate governance principles and practices can help ensure sustainable and cross-generational wealth transfer. Engineer Ajulu Ozodike is one of those rare Nigerian stories. Um, how often does a Nigerian made product, command premium brand, quality, and price over imported products. Until recently, he was the chairman of Kutix PLC, makers of Nigeria's premium electrical cables business. He has a BSc in mechanical engineering from University of Lagos, 1974, and an MBA from Harvard, 1977. A Siri Abwei is a partner with PricewaterhouseCoopers in the Africa Practice Business Unit. She's a private wealth advisor for family businesses, high net worth individuals, and family offices. She's focused on family governance, international tax, mergers and acquisition services to private equity firms, institutional investors, and multinational companies expanding across borders. She has graduate education from University of Ibadan, New York University and London Business School. 
Assyria, welcome. John Okonkwo is the Executive Director of Finance and Risk Management at VFB Group PLC, an investment firm interested in foreign exchange, debt investments, international remittances, real estate, and payment businesses. He has over 18 years experience in finance, audit, risk management, sustainable services, and corporate governance services. He was previously the CFO at Ayers Holdings and a manager in the Internal Audit, Risk, and Compliance Services Division of KPMG. He's an alumni, uh, alumnus of uh, Lagos Business School and holds a BSc in Mass Communications from Nandi Azikiwe University. And he's a fellow of in the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria. John, you're welcome as well. Jude Chemeka is the Divisional Head of Capital Markets at the Nigeria Exchange Limited. He's a highly respected leader in Nigeria's financial services industry. He held various chief executive positions at United Capital Securities, United Capital Asset Management, and Chapel Hill Denham Securities. Welcome to all the panelists. Um, you can see how I kind of zipped through the introductions because I realized this morning that we've got less than 50 minutes for this conversation. So um, it's going to be like one of those Mike Tyson fights. You blink, you, you miss the knockout. Um, but, you know, we're going to get right straight into it. Chifuzo DK, um, thank you for being available for this conversation. My key question and something I really want to know is why are most Igbo businesses unable to transcend generations. And here I'm thinking of the Kenneth Lichukus of this world, Ferdinand Anaira, you know, Ferdinand Industries, uh, and so on and so forth. You know, why were they unable to transcend from the founders to become corporate entities um, with a, a long lifespan? Over to you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, to get a good answer to your question, I have to go to the other world and ask Kennedy Lichu and Ferdinand that question. <laughs> <laughs> but I will only try. My own is a guesswork. Mm -hmm. These were gentlemen who, by dint of hard work and intelligence, set up businesses that made money. Okay? Mm -hmm. Um. They may have tried to convert those businesses to wealth, mm -hmm. but, they, but they were not able to. Mm -hmm. Maybe because they were so busy trying to build a business make, to make money that they didn't start early to organize them. And when I talk about wealth, if you go to other parts of the world, you find out that people sell their companies at a hefty premium. Mm -hmm. okay? Only here, very rarely do we hear about it, and it's mostly at the stock market. Mm -hmm. Okay, But in the other places, people still go and buy businesses that were founded by individuals. Mm -hmm. So I want to draw a distinction between making money, which is almost like it is ad hoc, mm -hmm. and creating, creating wealth, which is like deliberate. Mm -hmm. And if you want to create wealth, you have to have a structure around your business. It can't depend on you only. Mm -hmm. So the structures, preliminary structures, management with processes, procedures, and things like that, meetings scheduled at a particular time, reports, accounting, then you also will put a board. So you separate management from ownership, okay? The board sort of represents the owner's manager's run. So they didn't quite get to do that. And, what, what, uh, what's the difficulty? Again, because you're from Nnewi, you operate in Nnewi, nnewi has got all these great businesses. You talk mm -hmm. with them every day. What's the challenge? You know, because it has, we, have, we still haven't solved it. You know, many of the businesses that are started in this time haven't you, also prioritized to that level. You, you are right. You are right. Uh, this economy is a very opaque economy. And um, I remember I was talking to somebody. I said, people who have structured business, 
who have businesses that are, have good corporate governance. They don't know governors. They don't know the president. They don't know the ministers. They are not able to bring out a, a billion to donate for political considerations and things like that. And uh, you find that at times some of these things are very important and they lead to better money making mm. than structuring your business. But I think we it's reached the time for us to realize that what we are doing in our place is that every generation starts to reinvent the wheel their fathers had invented. And you can breathe, you can uh, grow the wealth of a society that way. The wealth exactly. of a society is best grown when one generation takes over the baton from the previous generation and moves, exactly. moves it on. If you go to other societies, you are you will see companies that were on 100 years ago still going. Some of mm -hmm. them may have been bought over by others. Mm -hmm. But in our places, you when you talk about a Kennedy ritual, there was Ojuku transport before that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then I can let you have finished. You're not sure is the transport. Mm -hmm. uh, so okay, this is not the way to grow wealth, societal exactly. wealth. And exactly. uh, I don't know the reason. The, I think most of them will want to want to uh, do it right. But uh, places like the stock exchange might have to come in. I know when we went public. We tried, we, the stock exchange then, I had to write a book. I, I had to write a small note to the president of the stock exchange after Goody Ibru in his valedictory speech, a short speech. Then I tried to mark out the places he mentioned, foreign, domestic, indigenous, okay? Foreign, 18 times. Domestic, zero. Indigenous, zero. So I wrote to Hayford Alile because that was the time two of us were starting our sure. business. Sure. I said, is this a foreign business exchange or a Nigerian business exchange? And, and so Chief, we're, we're, we're going to explore those, we're going to explore those, the uh, capital markets angle. But before we got, get there, uh, let me pull in John. Um, and here I'm, I'm looking to understand because because Chief has mentioned corporate governance a few times, and it's the theme for this discussion. Um, what does it mean for someone who invests in businesses? What does corporate governance mean? And here I'm not looking for the textbook definition. I'm looking for what it means to a practitioner like you and how it influences the choices you make in the uh, investment targets. You're muted, John. Thank you, Patrick, for that question. So uh, in simple terms, Corporate governance is about the system of, you know, rules, practices, you know, uh, that uh, companies are directed and controlled by. Okay, so, and these rules come in the form of policies and processes that are centered around some key principles. Some of which, are, one is a board. You know, earlier, if I, um, Uzo Dike talked about the need for a board. Now, one of the reasons why a board is central to good corporate governance practices is the fact that the success of a business largely depends on two things, in my view. The first is the quality of decisions, and the second is the speed of execution. Now, if you talk about the quality of decisions, of course, the, the saying goes that two good heads are better than one. Okay, so when individuals the economic literature of this world, they are individuals, right? Their heads may be good, but you know, if you add another good head, it is even better. So the quality of decisions that can come from a situation where you have a board setting that meets the requirement of sound corporate governance, which entails having you know, people that are from diverse background, that bring this, uh, different skill sets, different experience, different backgrounds, education and training together in reaching decisions. Such decisions would, of course, have you know, strategic decisions that will lead to sustainable business 
uh, uh, help in risk management and all of those things. So that is one area. The existence of a board is one of the things that make a, 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 a you know a company have good corporate governance. Another area is where you have a system of risk management. You know that is one of the things that a board helps to ensure that it is put in place. That system of risk management helps provide comfort to the board and other stakeholders that risks facing the company are being properly managed. Mm -hmm. And of course, risk is an everyday thing. You cannot run away from risk. You know, we often, when things are going so well, when the businesses are running so well, we tend to feel that everything is fine. And the risk that tells, you know, there, there's this story of a, a Chuck, who was the CEO of Citibank at the time. He once said that as long as the music is on, we must get up and dance because the businesses were doing well. And he felt there was need for everybody to get up and join the music and dance. You know, but the, and that was the time of subprime mortgages in the US. They were giving subprime mortgages, Citibank took part in, in the dance. And then the risk came, the adverse side came and everything went bad. Sure. A few months down the line, that same chalk that got up to dance was forced to resign. And that mm -hmm. was the impact of dancing without you know, managing risks. Exactly. So the, the uh, sound corporate governance practice means that companies will also think about risk, set up structures that enables the board and the owners to get that comfort, that assurance that risks are being managed adequately. Another exactly. one, mm -hmm. go ahead. Another one is in the area of business conduct and ethics. You know, the board will ensure that proper ethics and business conduct is put in place and that is, it drives what happens within the company. You know, there is the tendency to feel that in a country like uh, ours, that when things are not, when you don't know somebody in government and do all of those things, you will not do well, mm. you know? And then sometimes even people, some of our people who try to do things fraudulently, for instance, avoid payment of taxes and all of those things and work with their staff to do that, invariably are making their staff to know that they can participate in fraudulent practices and get away with it. Exactly. And these are some of the things that will affect the sustainability of the company when there is no mechanisms to manage fraud and all of those things. And let, let me let me let me jump to a Siri. Uh, just keeping my eye on the time and you know the number of issues we we need to go over. Um, a Siri, this is a space that you spend a lot of time in, especially with family businesses, right? Um, why why are these things that Chief and John, you know, these things that they've explained that kind of make sense? You know, if you want to grow your business, it makes logical sense. Why is it difficult for family-owned businesses to? adopt these corporate governances, uh, governance structures? And what are some of the lessons, you know, that you've seen around the world on how family-owned businesses have been able to transcend? Yeah, so um, thanks, Patrick. I think sometimes, too, it's just the fact that, you know, growth is not aligned with um, expectations. And sometimes the expectations are not also very clear for the parties involved. When family businesses are at their founding stage, you know, they're often systems deprived. And you typically will have founders that have very large personalities that want to continue to remain in control. And then there is that um, resistance to hand over to the next generation. Sometimes they may be perceive that the next generation is not capable or, you know, they're not fit to take over the business. And sometimes too, it's just because of their domineering personalities. So we've seen very often how that can, you know, disrupt um, um, transfer of wealth seamlessly. Um, when I talk about systems deprived as well, more often than not, you know, it's very on the go approach. You know, we want to take this decision very quickly. And just as John alluded, it's usually very thrive to have um, a body of advisors that help you to transcend or to take those decisions. And as businesses get complex, and even now where we have changing consumer markets, there are a lot of headwinds as well that continue to affect business growth. All of these systems are the things that support the kind of trajectory that's required.
from planning to budgeting to appraising to setting controls right, designing them as well so that, for instance, pilfering is not the order of the day within those businesses because your eyes cannot always be on every single lever at any given time. We've also seen that lack of structure in terms of the way the companies are, you know, prevents it from being handed over properly. So sometimes you might have significant estates and those estates are directly held by the individuals or the companies held or even the accounts. You may have filled your bank account and stated that this is your next of kin. Your next of kin does not necessarily mean those are the people that can then have access to those accounts to take those decisions. And so what then tends to happen is that decisions are halted, major strategic buyouts that could have happened cannot happen anymore because the right successors do not have access to those. Um, if I take, for instance, real estate, most times you find real estate that just dies off because you have that those real estate cannot be administered through court because they have not been able to pay the probate levies. And those private levies are cash driven. So 10% of the value of an illiquid asset, for instance, if the founder is off the scene, where do you find the cash to pay that as the next generation? And is there even interest to take over those type of assets? Do they, do they even know that those assets exist or that there is a family business that exists? So sometimes lack of communication, not sharing that vision as well with the next gen, prevents um, succession from happening. And there are quite a number of other reasons like competing interests amongst families or branches of families, especially when you consider that, you know, in Africa, we tend to be very polygamous in nature. Um, sometimes there's even disagreement on strategic direction of the business going forward, even where you have appointed, for instance, next gen in the life of the founder, organization structures or interest of non-family members getting in the way as well might be potential issues why they don't go forward. And then very often too, we tend to see that private and corporate assets are all mixed up. And these are structurings that could have happened while the founder was alive that never happened. They come with tax tickets, big tax tickets sometimes. And again, I think the balance too has to be made with maintaining companies in the short run and in the future, in, in the short run as we speak, and trying to balance that for future growth or preserving a legacy. And so very often the discussion about preserving your legacy doesn't come up until very late in time when the individual is old and gray. And exactly. the thing about succession is it is not an event, it is a process that needs to be planned for. And there are critical milestones that need to be achieved to prepare everyone involved, all stakeholders, including the government, before there is a handover. So I think these are some of the big issues that we tend to face. I wonder if you can, in maybe 30 seconds, uh, give me your best pitch, you know, to a trader, maybe not as educated, who's built up a fantastic business, but doesn't have all these structures. What's the best pitch that addresses um, some of the challenges that they have in their minds as to uh, putting in place the corporate governance structures? Yeah, I think, you know, your interest right now is preserving your family and taking care of your family. When you're long gone, you need to also think about how that family is also protected. And where that is going to be driven by is probably the businesses that you have built today. The businesses you have today also sustain the communities around you. And having any of those businesses die could also mean that you impoverish not only your family, but your community. It might seem a daunting process to go ahead with it, but there are basic steps that you start with. And some of those basic steps are things that you probably know, but haven't paid mind to because everything is moving too fast. So I think it's really taking a moment to breathe and see the bigger picture and then handling everything one step at a time. It's not a daunting process. It's just something you should take already. Um, for now. The pitch worked on me. Sadly, I don't have any monies to give, but it, it really <laughs> worked on me. Yeah. <laughs> Jude, um, if I can pull you in, um, does the capital market really care about these issues? You know, does the capital market care about corporate governance? Um, if yes, 
how does it reward those that go through the challenges of instilling, installing these types of uh, corporate governance structures and processes? Jude. All right, thank you. First, um, let me start by thanking uh, Anambra State for putting this sort of event together uh, and also for inviting this. I think we're having, I think we're having a bit of a- Heroes is really to help companies. Um, Jude, we, have... we lost you for, a, for a, a, a long second. If you could repeat that again. Okay, so I said, uh, well, I'm grateful to the, we are grateful to Anambra State for putting this together mm -hmm. and for inviting this change to be part of the conversation. So as executive director of capital markets, one of the key role is to try and help companies assess the public markets. Okay. Uh, and so does the, cap does the capital market care about sustainability and and best practices yes it does care uh, and and to um the point uh, that was made earlier around businesses that have been around but have not been able to uh transcend generation uh, the capital market ideally is one of those platforms that could help businesses uh, achieve such goals uh, because moving from a private company to assessing public funds requires you to put in place strict corporate governance. Uh, you could say best in class type of corporate governance practices to protect the investors primarily that will be investing in your business. Uh, and so when a company takes that uh, road of going public uh, and, and does all those things that are required to do uh, to be able to assess public funds, it helps the business uh, have the right structures, have the right board composition. I mean, self we say the minimum number of board members to have is five, uh, and you must have non-executive directors uh, as well as you must have an independent director. So that gives you the base uh, of structuring a business that is going to be sustainable because some of these business models are not even sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. Based on the need that the founder has found and was able to create a business. So businesses change, environments change, but if a business is committed to the highest level of corporate governance, obviously there'll be strategic review. You will have mm -hmm. the right management who will be taxed to look mm -hmm. at environment and scan environment. So businesses can start as a transportation company and they can metamorphose. And so the exchange actually helps companies uh, preserve their ability to stay longer in the game recognizing that really what would drive your continued existence is your ability to adapt to the changing environment but what is the base is just that level of corporate governance that puts the right processes the structures the policies that will enable that business to to run today mm -hmm. we're talking about esg related uh Issue. Some of these businesses that are private don't understand the basis of that. You know, if you want to run a business, you're more concerned about the profits you're going to make today. But it's important as a business that you start thinking about environment where you operate. You start thinking about the social impact where you operate. But more importantly, you have to start thinking about the right corporate governance structure that can allow you metamorphose and wither the storm as the business environment keeps changing. The right management team is a function of the right corporate governance that you have in place. I think this change role is to help companies to put their house in order mm -hmm. in order to be able to assess public markets. It's important for these companies because they need capital. They need exactly. capital for, for, for growth. And one of the ways to get that capital is to put your house in order. Your house has to be in order so that the investors who are coming into your business are assured that that business is worth investing in. And okay. that is the role the capital market plays. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, it's quite understood. So some of the people who may feel that the challenges of going public um, may be too much, in, in, in essence, it actually helps you um, to do the right things within your business. But if I can put Chief Uzodike in again, um, so let's assume that we all understand this, uh, but there are still challenges with 
effective succession planning. And congratulations, um, we, you've, you've done it over the years and you've just recently uh, transitioned. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about some of these challenges uh, that businesses at that level may face and how they transcend them? Chifu Zodike. You're muted. You're muted, sir. You're still muted. We can't hear you. <laughs> okay. Yes. Am I? Okay. Um, thank you very much. I lost connection yes. for a while. Okay, but uh, I had uh, the last statement Jude said. All those things are textbook. They are very nice. Uh, if I tell you the hell I went through getting critics quoted in the stock exchange, mm -hmm. the, the interminable delays, it might not be like that again because I haven't gone again since I went uh, in the 80s. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, there are some, there's so much in transparency in Nigeria. Okay. And uh, some of these things can be very disturbing. Some of the rules that are supposed to help the, the person manage the thing, the way they are administered, they look like punishment. And mm. uh, I, I, I remember that the Securities and Exchange was actually formed so as to help Nigerian companies come into the capital market. They've since forgotten that function. They, they are busy levying us this, and then if uh, FIRS or SPOT, they have, whatever they are called, have, has added their own. Everybody is a lot. And uh, you find yourself in between so many elephants, and you are a small Nigerian business trying to grow. But that doesn't remove from the merits of the capital market. It has a lot of merits. Mm -hmm. But like I told you, the the mentality of a lot of the people there. I told you about something that happened in the, in the I think it's early 90s, when I counted 18 mentions of foreign, no mention of domestic, no mention of indigenous. And I I sent it to Hayford Alile, who was the DG of the exchange. Is this a Nigerian stock exchange or, an, or a foreign stock exchange? Since then, they mentioned it, but let us know. I think we are thinking about the businesses. Mm -hmm. But as we are thinking about Nigerian businesses becoming good in corporate governance, getting bigger, we also know that that is the only way Nigeria can get bigger. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nigeria, many Nigerian big companies are appendages of foreign businesses. Okay? So we have to realize that it is an, in an interest to build it, find out how some other countries or economies build their own, all right? And uh, right now, if I know our people, if any of them wants to go to the stock exchange, the first thing they will do is to come and ask me, how interesting is it? And if I equivocate, <laughs> they are going to be concerned about mm -hmm. it. So. But we still have to find a way of attracting the people with benefits. Telling, telling me that it makes it easier for you to get money and things like that. I disagree. We've been in the stock exchange and companies that are not quoted in the stock exchange win billions from Nigerian Bank of Industry and all the others. And when we come there, they give us the rules. And I keep on wondering whether those rules are given to some of the other people exactly. who may not even have decent account, decent accounts. So uh, I'm not saying that the problem is all the regulatory agencies, but I'm saying that they they have to think about changing their role mm -hmm. to people who just administer uh, justice to. Uh 
people who are also required to groom. Exactly. And not be an impediment okay. to, to, to businesses. Huh? Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you, sir. And let me pull in, uh, uh, Seri. Uh, you, 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 you speak with family-owned businesses all across Africa. Um, again, what are some of the challenges with effective succession planning, right? And how should family-owned businesses think of bringing in professional management? Yeah, thank you, um, Patrick. I, so I think um, some of the issues with succession planning is even identifying the areas that need that succession. And I like to look at it in three broad ways, um, leadership, ownership, and management. Those three tend to be fused into one. So you just have the founder probably wearing those hats. Um, but important to then start to think that, you know, all of those areas as the business grows, becomes more complex, the environment changes, you need different personalities to wear those hats. You need systems in place to then connect all of these individuals and ensure that one person isn't using it to his own pers um, personal um, advantage over and above the company's um, interest. Um, so some of the things that need to start happening early is family dialogue, for instance. Uh, and, and that family dialogue is important to start to bring down any issues around entitlements, family members feeling that they should be the one fully in charge of those businesses, and also starting to respect where third parties are required as professionals to move it forward. But it's also important to understand that professionalizing the business does not necessarily mean that family members cannot lead the businesses because most of the businesses that lead the world today are indeed family businesses. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And and so much so because they continue to be dominated by the family members who are either owning significant shares or making the critical decisions there. Mm -hmm. But then you need to choose based on meritocracy as opposed to nepotism. So having that dialogue early enough, even from the time when they are young and training and identifying the right talent that can take up those leadership roles or management or ownership roles is important. For a child that is not necessarily interested in managing the business, they may very well be comfortable just being owners and it's okay. But identifying that path early enough is important. And then I think that leads very finely into just having a written succession plan because that's what, again, we don't necessarily have. So we can just think it up in our head and say, oh, that's my anointed successor. But it's important for it to be written and to be planned for. In professional organizations, we usually would have a pipeline of talent. And then we groom those talents until when they become executives within the business or partners. For instance, in PwC, it's a partnership of unrelated members and it continues to thrive. So there's something that we're doing right there. And that's really just encapsulated in professionalizing businesses using the right people and having the right systems. Mm -hmm. Having boards as well that contributes to your decision-making so that there is an independent view that balances your own personal view is important. And maybe just to sum it all up, you know, there is a trust equation where we say, what are those things you need to do to engender trust with your society, with your employers, with your community, with your family members? And the formula is really looking at intimacy, creating that environment for constant communication, engendering reliability that you can identify people that you rely on, credentializing the process that you're looking more about credibilities and the professional certifications of the individuals you're bringing on board. It divides those three things by self-orientation. So it means that the numbers at the top must be higher and the mm -hmm. number at the bottom must continue to reduce. And this is where I talk about domineering personalities, where you think only about self, 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 and you're not considering other views. Self-orientation is high. And so your trust value is lower. Mm -hmm. Once trust value is lower, it's unlikely that that brand will survive for generations. Okay. And so you must then start to reduce your self-orientation and be a lot more open-minded and view people you know, look at different perspectives. And maybe the one perspective I want to live with is there is that myth that says, once you've gotten to the third generation, that business cannot move forward. And so it talks about sleeves to sleeves in three generations. It's a bad 
um, 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 a myth. Uh, and the reason I say so is because it makes it feel like the next generation cannot handle the business. Now, the thing to take away from that is there are businesses that have gone beyond three generations and they have done so by doing the right things. And those right things are the things we continue to talk about with all the case studies that we look at, which is communication, succession planning, retirement planning, identifying external careers and assessments, agreeing on strategies and documenting them, having the right systems to implement them. And okay. so having that myth at the back of your mind and always constantly debunking it through the strength of the processes and systems that you put in place is very critical. And this is a place where you then start to think of what can the next gen offer? While the founder has been visionary and entrepreneurial in starting a business, the people to continue that business will be a different set of people. And usually it lies with the next gen who are caterers of innovation. Exactly. And so that perspective needs to change that the next generation can handle it. They can handle it because really they are one of the main protagonists in any succession plan. So founder yeah. and successor needs to start to have those conversations for it to happen successfully. Okay. Exactly. Thank you so much for, for that contribution. And, you know, I'd like to pull in John uh, again, uh, because VFD Group invests uh, in businesses. And I'm sure that one of the things you look out for will be how to sustain those businesses, you know, for generations, you know, uh, even after you've exited. Um, so what are some of these sustainability principles that are imperative for businesses that wish to transcend generations. You know what are what are those principles that you look out for, huh? and that if you don't find them, you also try to instill in the businesses, mindful of the very severe headwinds that uh, companies in Nigeria must confront with every day. Um, no point uh, rehashing the the challenges we face as business people. But you know what are what are those things? Those sustainable principles that you look out for. Thank you again, uh, Patrick. So essentially in, in making investments, the key things we look out for are companies with subpar performance, you know, and you would, uh, uh, from experience, what you typically find is that the major reason behind subpar performance in companies is usually things associated with corporate governance, right? And so, if you look out for those companies and you are able to sort out the corporate governance issues, the companies begin to do well, right? And mm -hmm. even undervalued companies, most of the times, the reason why they are undervalued are essentially because the reputation around them, people, you know, investors do not easily see sound corporate governance practices that enable them to see the value behind those companies. So the moment you come in and deal with those corporate governance issues, those companies begin to do well. The other things are around, you know, with these days we talk about ESG principles, you know, all the environmental, social, and governance issues. All of these things still revolve around risk management, which I have talked about earlier. So when you deal with corporate governance issues, you instill better risk management principles in those companies you're able to immediately see a sudden change that will make the companies that you previously saw as sub-performing or undervalued, that they will be transformed to bigger value that you begin to tap in. So those are the key things we look out for when we make those investments and ensuring that sound risk management principles are instilled mm -hmm. and the companies will automatically shift. No, no, thank you. Thank you for that. And uh, Jude, let's come back again to your experiences in the capital market, especially around investments and capital mobilization. You know, so several business surveys will show that access to capital is a significant business challenge, um, irrespective of size or scale or years of uh, operation. Um, what challenges prevent businesses from accessing local and foreign investments for economic growth? And are there innovative... Uh, 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 you know, help businesses address this? And what are some of the corporate governance type things that in investors are looking to see 
to enable them put money in in these businesses jude all right thank you very much i i'm sure you're aware that bfd recently listed on the exchange main board um which is really part of one, one of the many boards on the exchange we do have the growth board uh, we also have the premium board uh which really is the board that takes care of the highest level of governance um, what we have found is investors typically uh, both international and domestic investors prefer companies that operate in that segment of the market because they have the highest level of corporate governance and so corporate governance is really the catalyst really for investors to be able to raise capital um for sorry for companies to be able to assess capital uh, the main the the growth board uh, that exchange currently has uh, it allows smaller companies uh, to be able to also assess capital. So it's not so much about size; it's really the principle behind the operation of the business. And so the exchange uh, is a platform provider for these corporates to be able to assess the many investors. We have the domestic institutional investors. We have the retail investors, and we also have the international investors that patronize the market. It's important to understand that access to capital by these businesses is really more a function of the sort of level uh, of the level of corporate governance that those businesses operate. Uh, and so the solution uh, to a large extent of access to capital will be for a business to have the right corporate governance structure, because that's really what investors are looking out for. And it's not so much about a particular asset class. So as, as a, a company that is assessing the capital market, you can come by way of uh, equities raise. You can also come by way of uh, debt. So you can actually raise debt to finance your projects. So what we have done is to try to create different products that these companies can actually utilize to finance different areas of their businesses. For instance, we have the green bond. So there's a lot of conversation around sustainability. And so some of the things that the company may want to do could actually be around sustainability type of uh, investment. So there's really no point in trying to raise capital through the plain vanilla bonds that you have. So you can utilize the green bonds uh, to be able to finance those operations. Today, we're also talking about Islamic products. And those are products that you will have investors invest in these instruments. So if a company is looking to uh, engage in an activity that can be financed through that methodology, then it becomes easier to find investors. Because what, what we're trying to do is to bring investors that have this capital together so that the companies who are looking for this capital can have access to the capital. But obviously, bearing in mind that uh, the SEC is more concerned about the level of corporate governance because investor protection is really key uh, in terms of the administration of the exchange. Uh, there's, there's this adage about coming to the exchange. I do understand uh, the position uh, also DK has, uh, Chief also DK has. So, so you have all these levies and all these layers of taxes and visibility that is um, that being listed uh, confers on the confers on the companies. But it's also important to also establish that those sort of regulatory requirements that these companies meet. It's essentially the reason why they're able to assess capital in the first place from the exchange, because these investors are looking for companies that can be well managed based on the sound corporate governance practices that they have in place uh, for a sustained uh, business. Uh, and that is the reason why you see all these sort of uh, levies or, or, or many uh, hurdles those companies we have to cross. But at the exchange, we've simplified it. Okay, so so today, if you're a small company, the requirement for raising capital is quite different from if you're a large company. And so for, for smaller companies that are operating within a small scale, I mean, with 500 million uh, market cap, you can actually access capital from this change. Uh, you just need to have shareholding structure of about 51 uh, and a free float of about 15% of your shares you should be able to assess capital from this change. So this change continues to be a platform for corporates to be able to raise capital. What is key for these corporates is to maintain the standard corporate governance practices 
so that these investors can invest uh, in their companies. And I think I think Chifu Zodiko understands that. I think maybe the point, and I'm not speaking for him, but I think the point he was trying to raise is that sometimes uh, it appears that the bureaucrats um, in SEC, FIRS, et cetera, may forget that their job is to help promote businesses and they become um, a bit of, uh, what's a more technical term than vampires, you know, uh, on, on the businesses, you know, where they instead of supporting the businesses, it's almost like they're putting stumbling blocks uh, along their path. Uh, if you could speak to that for like 30 seconds on uh, how you, uh, the Nigeria Exchange has also tried to address many of these concerns, Jude. All right, thanks. So there's the advocacy piece uh, that the exchange is really involved in, because if you think about it, uh, and Chifuzo, Chifuzo Rike did allude to that, Earlier, most of the companies that were listed were really foreign affiliated companies. But because of all the various policies that have been in place in the generation, we have seen uh, companies come to list. So we do recognize that really to trigger listings in the Nigerian capital market, it has to be on the back of policy of the government. So there's a lot of advocacy work uh, that this change is doing in, in that regard. Uh, we have also found out by, I mean, by studies that listed corporates are typically uh, more compliant when it comes to taxes. And so we're making uh, a lot of advocacy work so that these companies that are listed should actually pay less uh, or should be given some form of uh, rebate because they are generally more tax compliant. And so the general summary of it is that this change is really involved in advocacy to ensure that listed corporates have the right visibility uh, have the right access to different product means by which they can raise capital from the market. But more importantly, that the policies that are operating in the Nigerian environment are such that the local businesses can actually thrive. That is a key area where the exchange is working. It's also important to point out that we have partnerships, not just in the local environment, but also internationally. And one of the reasons for this in partnership is we do recognize that access to capital may not be necessarily look domesticated. You can actually uh, look to other jurisdictions to be able to raise capital. CEPLA today is able to raise capital from London, even though they are listed on the exchange. So they have access to a larger pool of investors because we have a, uh, an MOU with the London Stock Exchange. Exactly, exactly. So we're, we're, we're now down to four minutes or thereabouts. So I'll just go quick round robin, last words, last comments, you know, maybe something you want to talk about that I didn't get to. Um, although I still have so many things I want to get to. For instance, if Chief Uzodike wants to use his last one minute to, you know, share with us, how do you convince your contemporaries in Newi? to go down this path? You know, what is it that you can say to them that can get them to start looking at how to build businesses that transcend them? Chifu Zodike. You're still muted, sir. You're muted, you're muted, sir. So we can't hear you. You're muted. Okay. Is the host is the host that is controlling the meeting? Ah. Okay. 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 <laughs> so uh, let's create a win-win situation. Okay. Then it will help to convince them. First of all, I need the help of Jude <laughs> to see the companies that are enjoying the stock exchange. Mm -hmm. The companies that are already quoted in the stock exchange that are enjoying, get them a critical mass. Then John and Co. and the theory, some of their success stories, because you ask them about investing, investing. Have you really invested in any, what you might call 100% indigenous company? Mm -hmm. So if we have enough success stories, Outside of Ajolo and Kutix, we can band them together and use them to promote that this thing pays. Nothing yes. succeeds like success. So we, we have to be able to tell some of these success stories. Right now, I don't know whether there are enough. So mm -hmm. that's what I'm going to say. It's nice Thank to talk about the advantages 
let's see those who have enjoyed those advantages and then we can go. I will join them in Excellent. selling it. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much, sir. Let me go to John. One minute. Okay, so uh, the major thing for me will be around uh, encouraging the businesses, especially in our state Anambra, you know, to go public. And the the reason is, you know, um, one of the reasons is the fact that studies have shown that some of the more successful businesses. You know, if we talk about the Ford, Walmart, LG, Fiat, BMW, some of the biggest names we hear, which today we think are big businesses at the beginning, they are actually family businesses that are started small, but ultimately grew, and they have been sustained over the ages, such that today we look at them and think they are they started as big corporations. These are family businesses. So, and the only differentiator was the fact that these people imbibed some of those principles that Siri talked about earlier, you know, and also embraced corporate governance. And that is why they've been able to sustain it from across generations up to today. And we look at them with so much admiration. So I will encourage our people to think in the way of imbibing those corporate governance principles there are also now family governance principles, which we've extracted as we went along. Some of these family governance principles, we help ensure that these businesses are sustained over the years. And once mm -hmm. that is done, there are those of us that are there looking out for such investments that start doing well so that we will help them to inject capital into the businesses and take it to the next level. Fantastic. So we look forward to, to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jude, one minute. All right. Thank you. I mean, the summary of it is that exchange uh, is really a worthy partner uh, for businesses. Uh, we will continue to uh, create products, democratize opportunities for the many investors who actually have capital that utilize our platform so that it's easier for corporates to be able to raise capital uh, to sustain their business. Corporate governance practice, or best-in-class corporate governance practice, is really the way to go for these corporates uh, trying to be sustained in the long run because uh, coming, becoming listed automatically will, allow, will enforce you uh, to adopt some of these good corporate governance practices that will sustain your business in the long run. Thank you. Excellent. And uh, Siri? Yeah, I think um, so the corporate governance is not only for publicly listed companies. There are also best practices for private companies. I think we have that also enshrined in the Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance of 2018, which spells out some of the things that, you know, you can do to elevate the status of your company pending the time when you probably want to list. So I think it shouldn't deter um, a lot of the companies that are on board here from adopting it. The second thing as well is um, going, there are examples of companies that have raised funds outside of the stock exchange. And I give an example like Sundry Foods Limited. I think they had partners from North Fund, for instance, which is a development finance institution. And one of the attractions apart from their profitability is also their governance structure. So you will be doing yourself a disservice where you don't embrace that pending such a time where you um, list. Um, it's also good to start planning early. And some of those we have mentioned, I think the one thing I want to add is around training of the next gen. And last but not the least, in terms of taxes, it's true the environment in Nigeria is really tough. And that also reduces the ease of doing business as it relates to the country. But right now we do have a presidential fiscal policy reform committee that has been set up. And the um, engagement portal has also been open for us to um, lobby for the changes that we want to see. Um, if we don't speak, then we probably will not have a chance to make a change. So please take advantage of that opportunity as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, the organizers of this uh, discussion have asked that we take a few questions. So I crave your indulgence if we can grant me another five to ten minutes. 
um, so we take some questions. I see a hand up. Ifoma Mwahiri, can you go mute? Yes. Good evening. Thank you, everyone, for all you have said. Um, I was just thinking during the, the, the conversation going on that uh, this program was organized for families who don't understand corporate governance. And my thinking is that corporate governance, as discussed here, has not, is not clear enough to enable any, any family uh, business owner make a decision whether or not to, to go the route some of us are recommending. Now, corporate governance, as we know it, and as provided by the law and regulations, can actually kill a business. So that information has not, it's not, has not been communicated clearly. Let's take, for instance, you have, um, if, in my own thinking as a lawyer, corporate governance should promote dynamism. It should be able to, a, 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 your governance structure should be dynamic enough to suit whatever business you are doing. Sure. But what you have in the guidelines doesn't encourage that. And that's why the camera is the best corporate governance um, guide. Because it encourages dynamism. Okay. Now, when you have, let me, when you have the, let's take the set code of corporate governance. It's, I find it distracting in the sense that the Securities and Exchange Commission, they're supposed to focus on ensuring full disclosure. In fact, that was the objective of establishing that um, the, the institution in the first place. That's in the Investment and Securities Act. Their focus, the objective was to ensure full disclosure of companies. Sure. And if they had done that, it would if, have if really we can, helped. We can wrap up in 10 seconds. You know, so we can yeah, investors, yeah. It's just like you going to a restaurant and trying to make a decision on what meal you should take. So if they do that, just ensure that companies disclose the way they govern themselves. The investor can decide on what, how, you know, whether they want to invest in the company or not. Okay. So that's my recommendation. Thank you. For as long as corporate governance is concerned, try to define it better. So that companies, families that have owned these businesses can go into it. Thank and I would have loved Mr. John to, to give us share a case study of what he talked about. Uh, a, a company who that didn't have that uh, corporate governance, they introduced it and they began to do well. I would have loved him to give okay. us a case study of that. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll get to that. Um, Onyeka Mwobu. Can you unmute? If you can. Uh, yes, I can. Um, good afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Um, I especially want to thank the panelists. It's been a great dialogue. Um, I have questions for Isiri and for Mr. John. Um, so my question, my first question will go to um, Isiri. And just for context, I'm uh, in the startup space. And these are businesses that are relatively new. Um, so I just want to set that context, but I am a strong advocate for thinking about developing ESG frameworks, even from the onset, on from the onset or from the early stages. So um, to Isiri, you spoke about the importance of thinking futuristically um, in order to protect like legacy, family members, and then, you know, like just community at large um, sure. in your experience, how early should a business owner start thinking about, you know, family success? Session or how late is too late, if I can ask it in, in that way. Thank you very much. Thank you. I thought you had a question for John as well. Uh, yes, I do. Um, okay, so I'll just ask that as well. Um, to Mr. John, um, you spoke about the importance of curating a board for business accountability, risk management, and also effective growth. What are practical ways that um, I would like for you to think about my question from the angle of startup founders. What are practical ways that they can or they should go about bringing together a board? What type of board is best recommended for them to begin with? And what 
um, can these businesses that basically have limited capital or resources, what can they offer to keep um, um, board members invested? Excellent. Thank you very much. And I'll just take the last question from the from the chat room. It's from Chuba Eze. And he says, can you build transgenerational companies outside the stock market? And I'll probably direct that to Jude. So there are a couple of questions here um, from Ifoma Wahiri, uh, and it's directed at John. Um, example of companies without corporate governance uh, that did better, if I got that question correct. John. Okay, thank you. So I, I think um, I will also take uh, Wahiri's first uh, concern about corporate governance being a burden mm -hmm. on companies, and you know the the way Kama is one of the best corporate governance tools. I will I will just say yes, Kama is a very good aspect of corporate governance in Nigeria, but even the Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance 2018 also has principles that support you businesses because it's actually an apply or explain. So it, why it sets out corporate governance principles about you know 17 of them and it says that companies are required to either apply those principles or explain the circumstances why they cannot apply it. So it's not as if it, it compels companies that they must use those principles. So there is, there is that flexibility, which is one of the things she says is encouraged by Kama. So that flexibility remains there. In terms of an example of a company, I can give you the very quickly the example of Transcorp, Transnational Corporation of Nigeria. That company, from inception, it had a lot of big eggheads, but very quickly because of governance issues, you know, the company be began to go down such that people that bought shares at six naira immediately the shares went down to less than fifty for, to fifty kobo, which was the minimal amount that could be allowed. But when investment was made in that company and the governance, a proper governance system was put in place, that business has been transformed. Today is the toast of uh, investors. Thank you. I think the third question is about the, the kind of board yes. that, could be, yeah, that could be set. And I would say that um, also governor, corporate governance practice, uh, principles also stipulate the kind of thing. So depending on the size and complexity of the business, you know, that's what we determine the um, size of the board as well. But the key thing is that you the board has enough diversity in terms of knowledge, experience. If you are, for instance, operating in the fintech space or the IT industry that requires a, a lot of innovation and all of those things, the diversity expected on your board is such that you have people with IT experience and skills. It's not so much about how much you pay them, but it's about bringing the right people that have the right skills and the experience, and also independence. Because part of the problem that small businesses have is that taking decisions on their own, you know, and doing a lot of things without thinking about the implication on the long-term effect of the business. So if you bring in independent directors who have no stake in the business other than to come in and help the business to grow, these people will inject their views and ideas and ultimately help the business to grow. So it's not so much about the, having a, a very big board that you pay so much to them or other. It's about having the right mix of skills, experience, you know, and, and um, knowledge that will enable the company to grow, you know, come up with the right strategies that will drive the business of the company. Exactly. And let me just build on that Onyeka's question. So she's in the startup space, I believe. And, you know, startup businesses may not be well resourced to find the big hitter board members. Um, is there an argument that a startup, a founder can put in front of people he wants, he, he or she wants to be on uh, the, their board uh, to make them join where it is not another financial burden on the founder? Yes, I think a, a lot of people are looking and and these days there are a number of organizations that are actually set out on you know access to finance and helping um small companies to grow there are many even ngos development finance institutions and all of those things that have the expertise and they are willing to support all they need is to see the seriousness on the part of the the business owner to see that the business owner is open to having a structure 
in place, which is what we're talking about in terms of corporate governance. You can see if anywhere we go, everything still falls back to this corporate government, which is the subject of our discussion. So once mm -hmm. the, the those people and investors like us, we are on the lookout for people that we just show that they are committed to putting structures in place. Once that commitment is there, there are a lot of people, a lot of organizations, a lot of um, development finance institutions that we easily give you the skill set, the people that we provide those skill sets without exactly. even demanding any money from you. So it's exactly. that commitment to governance that is central to everything that you do, not necessarily the size of the business or the money you have to pay. Exactly. Thank you so much. Esiri, there's a question for you. Um, how early should a business owner start thinking about you know, corporate governance, putting a board together, and all the other structures and processes? Yeah, I think she talked about succession planning. Um, how early should we start succession planning? Correct. Yeah. So because succession planning will come in diff uh, different phases, you know, um, leadership, ownership, and management. For management, strictly, it will be within the confines of the business. So as early as the business has started. But when you look at family families who you are trying to bring into the business, succession starts from birth. And we like to look at it across five buckets. So from birth, you're already instilling the family values in them. And some we're already doing that, most of us, and also breeding the entrepreneurial spirits through financial literacy. As little as it can get is very important to start. Your piggy bank, learning to save, learning to buy, understanding the currencies are also very important at that stage. And then you move into the second phase where you start to prepare and get to make those decisions around who might be potentially, uh, who might be the potential successors. And that's around the secondary education and also having careers outside business. And this is where we talk about internships as well. So they start, you start to own certain skills that may be required. And then you transit into entering into the business. Sometimes at this point, we do have family constitutions that have been set up that have sections on employment policies of and it states at what point family members can come into the family. Some families have a preference for bringing their children perhaps at the top level or and some at the mid level and some just want them to start from ground or bottom or, um, to the top. So it's at that point you start to implement the decisions you have taken in the constitution around the family policy and we call that stage the transition stage. And then the fourth bucket is around confirmation and handover. So the number of years during transition is usually specified. It might be seven to 10 years before they then grow into roles where they start to share executive responsibility with the MDs or the founders. And during that same period, the MD is preparing to exit. And then there is some adaptation that is happening for who will take over as MD or CEO and who then takes over as chairman. So it's for the entirety. And just to the question around whether we have businesses that are transcending generations, I'd like everyone to just go online as well. There is a company called GB Tanri. They are 100 years old, sitting out in Kano, and they've actually been interviewed by CNN as well. We had them over at our family business summit where we you know, had discussions, interesting discussions with the current generation and the fourth generation. And interesting to see how they have grown from just being a very crude business to now being um, an automated business of sorts, but then they still have miles to go in terms of moving from processing leather. So they process hides and skin into different forms of leather. They actually supply some of the biggest brands that we know, like Louis Vuitton. And now where they can probably get to, in fact, the sky is the limit. So they can start to make those bags. They can start to expand their rich cross border and this is what businesses in Nigeria also need to do more of. We're not just building for Nigeria. We can build for Africa. We can build globally. And the structure for doing that is has been applied the world over. And we can apply it here as well. Fantastic. And uh, can, what's the name of the company again? GB Tannery? GB Tannery, yes. Tannery. Excellent. Thank you. And Jude, maybe that question was meant for you, but uh, maybe you've got a... One last comment before we bring it to a close. Well, thanks. To have trans transgenerational companies outside of the stock market, but it's important to, to point out that this inherent value of being listed. First, you have better visibility, greater exposure, 
you have access to a larger pool of capital, larger investor base. There's a secondary market trading for your shares. So there's liquidity uh, for the company and ability to grow inorganically, uh, just leveraging their, their listing on exchange. And, and if you really want to think about it, all the major big establishments or corporations that we hear about, even in Nigeria, are all listed. So there's huge value uh, for, 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 for being listed on the exchange. What is really key for corporations or companies to be able to transcend all these uh, generational gaps is to begin to adopt all that we have said, which is really the core of it, the best practices around corporate governance, take into consideration the environmental impact of your operation, the social impact, the, the state of your workers. We're talking about even gender inclusiveness and then the government, uh, the governance structure that you imbibe. Having a board structure, even if you're running a small company, you can start by having just that board structure. It gives you the discipline and it allows you to do things the right way uh, as opposed to doing it just because a lot of these businesses are not able to separate themselves from the business that they run because of entrepreneurship, drive, and passion. And that is not sustainable. But having the right corporate governance structure in place allows the business to run independent of the owner. And that is really what is key. Thank you. Fantastic. And uh, just to bring it all together, I want to again um, thank everyone, all the uh, panelists, for your contributions. We set out to find answers to some critical questions, you know, corporate governance, wealth transfer and succession planning, investment and capital mobilization, legal and regulatory challenges. And I think we did a pretty good job um, in touching on those issues, but obviously there is way, way too much more uh, that we need to talk about. But most especially to thank the leadership of uh, ANSIPA, Anambra State Investment Promotion and Protection Agency, um, for thinking that this uh, topic was worthy to bring forward. And uh, hopefully the ideas we've shared here would help them in their work in trying to help many of the businesses in Anambra State transcend generations and become more successful corporates. And on that note, I thank the panelists um, for uh, joining and every all, all the other participants. And I wish you all uh, a fantastic day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Patrick. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Siri. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.